means is that those of us who are outside of the administration, who basically have no power to determine decisions, sit there and have very limited input into how the county councils actually run. And I actually have conversations with conservative members in quiet corners where they go, oh, Sarah, it's all right for you, at least you can ask questions. At least you, can speak. <laughs> you can present another point of view in the chamber. You can actually start making points that nobody else is going to make. You can ask pertinent, relevant and irritating questions and you can keep asking them. But it has happened that I've moved the motion and it's been seconded unexpectedly by, uh, by one of um, the Liberals from the District Council. It was after the Tottenham riots. The leader had got up and presented a, a motion thanking uh, the police um, writing to the Secretary of State expressing their thanks on how the uh, Gloucestershire Police uh, dealt with the riots in Gloucestershire. And I stood up and put an amendment that we also request that the cuts to funding that the police force was uh, uh, about to receive, uh, that the Secretary of State would withhold those cuts until after an inquiry into the riots and the policing of the riots. And <clears throat> The Liberals stood up and seconded the amendment, which put them in a rather interesting position. So, if they supported my amendment, they would basically be voting against their own government. If they voted against the amendment, they would basically be voting for cuts to funding to the police force. They were not very happy. The <laughs> was incandescent with rage, almost, and stood up and accused me of being overtly political. <laughs> Sadly, the Labour Party has entirely given up the fight yeah. about where our debt problems come from. Mm -hmm. The debt problems do not come from excessive government spending. They come, came because we had to rescue the banks. Mm -hmm. The financial crash, the financial mismanagement, the financial lack of regulation is what created a large amount of our current borrowings. You know, if it truly was, you know, spending that got us all the pro into the problem of the borrowing, well then maybe more borrowing is a problem. But if it wasn't that kind of spending that the borrowing that caused the problem, then we're in a very different place. And it's also a question, of course, of what you borrow the money for. There's the question of borrowing to bail out the banks, but there's also the question of borrowing to do things like buy new tribal nuclear weapon systems. But borrowing to insulate houses, borrowing to put solar panels on roofs, borrowing to improve your public transport system, you know, it's Green Party policy, we'd renationalise the railways, which wouldn't cost us a cent because we just wait for the contracts to lapse, but then we can borrow to invest and get the, re the returns for ourselves, not the returns for private companies. So the policy we're pursuing at the moment, of which um, uh, Molly Scott Cato refers to as Austeria <laughs> isn't actually working in reducing our borrowing because our borrowing is actually going up even, even as we cut back on public spending. So it's not a, there, there's something really simple about the idea of look, you've overspent, the, con you know, the country has maxed out its credit card and now we need to tighten our belts back and pull it all back in. So that analogy of the economy as household finance is, is comforting because it's understandable and but it's wrong. You know, it's just so wrong, it just so doesn't work. And it's been proved not to work. We've had five years of it not working. And it hasn't just worked in the UK, it also hasn't worked in Portugal, in Greece, in Spain, in Cyprus, in France. It's not impossible. Labour will go into the next election as they did when Tony Blair was elected, promising to keep Tory spending promises. And Caroline Lucas said the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And that has run so true when she said that. It just made it just encapsulates what I think. <laughs> I have changed the debate that takes place at county. I have continually raised the question of emissions and CO2 mm -hmm. and climate change because given the choice, that would have just slipped off 
every other politician's agenda. They just do not want to think about it, they don't want to cost it, they don't want to qualify what is going to happen. They don't actually know what to do about it. They can't see what steps to take. So we have kept that on the agenda. And it's actually a measure of progress of how much our kind of politics has made progress. So I'm going to credit particularly UK Uncut here. Yeah. That we now have David Cameron standing up and actually saying multinational companies and rich individuals must pay their taxes. Exactly. <laughs> saying it. You may have noticed I said saying it. Of course he's not actually doing anything about it. In fact, he's changed the law in some very specific ways that actually makes it much easier for multinational companies to avoid paying their taxes. Well, the next thing for David Cameron to do is to go to Caroline Lucas's private members bill, the Tax and Financial Transparency Bill of 2011. And that, create, that has a whole set of measures of what could make some really significant moves towards making particularly multinational companies pay their taxes. And we've set the model out there. We can say to David Cameron, and we do say to David Cameron, implement this. Now, in our 2010 General Election Manifesto, what we said then was that the 50p tax rate should start at earnings over £100,000. Of course, what's just happened is that the Tories have dropped that rate from 50p to 45p at £150,000. So, that's what we said in 2010. I think the, the manifesto we're going to take into the next election will have a higher tax rate. Uh, revolving retrofit loan fund. It actually sets up a loan fund by which middle to low income households can borrow money to improve the energy efficiency of their houses. The interest rate is lower than the Green Deal, 5%. The options for actually improving their house are far more flexible than the Green Deal. <laughs> but the key point about what we got through last night was that it actually, it actually allows the council to use some of its own money to lend to people in the district so they can make their houses warmer and more energy efficiency. It takes people out of fuel poverty, it prevents fuel poverty, and because it's, we're using Seven Way Energy as the agency to guide it, they will direct people to local installers, creating local jobs. So, I mean, I have almost joined the, the pothole brigade because of the state of Gloucestershire's roads. I've, I've resisted for a long time. But at the moment, to me, the state of our roads are actually indicative of the state of our county provided services. It's still working. Bits of it are pretty good. That bit of the slab road, just down at the junction, is really nice. <laughs> About a quarter of a mile, there's not a single pothole there. There's only one place in the country where we have something that you can say it looks like Greens in government, and that of course is in Brighton and Hove, the first Green council in the country. Now, it's really tough because it's a minority administration, which means they can't just decide to do things. And indeed some of the things that they've tried very hard to get through, like a rise in council tax that would have basically allowed them two years ago to set a no-cuts budget, they couldn't get it through because Labour joined with the Tories to knock it down. But despite all the difficulties, when you start to look at the list of what the Greens have achieved in Brighton and Hove, it's really a damn impressive list. One of the nice things that Caroline referred to in the broadcast was making it a living wage council, because we believe that the minimum wage should be a living wage. If you work full time, you should earn enough money to live on. It's a basic, decent principle. And one of the really important things, and where this can really start to make a difference, is not just insisting that all of the council staff are paid a living wage, but that all of the contractors, the people working under the contractors, are paid a living wage too. Now, that's really critically important because one of the, uh, the great excuses for outsourcing and privatisation that we've seen in recent years is, oh, we've got to do it because it's cheaper. Now, we know very often it doesn't actually turn out to be cheaper, but what it does turn out is that the staff's wage and conditions get absolutely slashed. And if we insist that every contract, all of the staff are paid a living wage under it, then suddenly 
the arguments for keeping things in-house, or indeed even bringing them back in-house, start to become much clearer and much easier to make and much harder to refute. The party, the Greens were the only political party who submitted um, uh, evidence to something called the Waste Core Strategy, which is basically the underpinning document for how any planning application coming forward about waste is going to be decided in Gloucestershire County Council. So it was really boring, it was incredibly tedious. I mean, the document itself is, is about this thick. And then there is like reams and reams and reams, an unbelievable amount of sorting evidence to do with it. And um, three of us ploughed through it, Chris Harmon, Giles Hartley and myself, and we looked at this stuff and we looked at the evidence for the waste call strategy and we said, no, we think this is wrong. We think it's wrong for this reason and we think you need to change this, this and this. We submitted it, we turned up at the inquiry in public, we argued that point because we understood how important that document was to making the decisions for Gloucestershire's future. It was boring and tedious, but we bloody well did it. <laughs> <laughs> so what that meant, when the planning decision, when the planning committee met and was going to make its decision about Javelin Park, the figures in that document that they were deciding against, which were justifying the need for the mass burn incinerator, had massively been reduced down. Now, I'm not going to stand here, I wish I could, and say, that was because of me, that was because of Gerald and Chris. It wasn't just us. We were backed up by a whole range of other people, but we were all making that argument, and the inspector took that argument, and he changed those figures. And there was then no need, there was no justification for that mass burn incinerator. And what will happen when the inspector comes to decide it at appeal, because there will be appeal, I imagine, he will be using that waste call strategy to make the decision. I probably will be a man. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing with the, with the dreadful bedroom tax, the people who are actually able to move are going to be living in even more and more overcrowded housing. Indeed, two children of the same sex have to share a bedroom. And just imagine the situation, you know, the 15-year-old the doing their GCSEs, trying to do their homework, with the, the seven-year-old shares the room rampaging around. And think of how that child is disadvantaged against the middle-class child with their own bedroom and their own space and a nice quiet space and computers and everything. You take away the libraries and you're taking away the space where that child can go and work in reasonable quiet, has access to a computer, Wi-Fi and all the rest of it. So in Brighton and Hove, they haven't closed any branch libraries. It's, it's becoming a 20 mile per hour area. All of the central areas are going to be 20 mile per hour in Brighton. And you know, the, the basic formula is really simple. There should be a 20 mile per hour limit everywhere that people live, work and shop. They've maintained the eligibility criteria for social care. Now in many parts of the country, what's happened is the eligibility for that kind of social care has been sliced down and down. So you've got to be in the absolute most acute need basically unable to get out of the bed in the morning, unable to bath yourself before you can get social care. It's Bioregional, which is a very major NGO, has declared um, Brighton and Hove to be the first, the first city in the world to be on the path to one planet living. It's the world's first officially declared one planet living city. It's on the path to it. We're living in Britain as though we have three planets and we have to cut it down to one. And that covers a whole range of things, you know, in terms of carbon emissions, of soil erosion, uh, you know, even, you know, the, the quality of our air and air pollution. You're trying to squeeze all of that into one thing and three planets to one planet is kind of a shorthand way of getting all of that. But the fact that Brighton and Hove is actually, you know, has won the official independent designation of the world's first one planet living city is something we really do need to trumpet around and celebrate. Is that Andrew has almost single-handedly got more than 50,000 houses in Kirklees fully insulated. Each, one of the, each household is saving about 250 pounds a year on their energy bills. And you know, one of the things that I very often say to the government is why is it that we currently have no government money going into home insulation? Yeah. Yeah. It creates jobs and long-lasting stable jobs because there's an awful lot of homes to insulate. 
it saves fuel poverty, it gets pretty well every house, poor household, you do it for out of fuel poverty, and it cuts carbon emissions. Why are we not spending any government money on insulation? But Chad, you know, used to get really cross because I was asking the same question again. <laughs> I said perhaps you'll answer it this time, Chad. <laughs> a coherent water management strategy for the whole of the foam catchment area. I think that's really, really exciting to have that joined up idea. Not just looking at flooding, but looking at water quality and looking at biodiversity. So my dream of paddling in the throne as a newly returned salmon goes swinging by. Yeah. And what we need to achieve basically is an entire reformation, an entire reconstruction of how our economy works. Because it's very clear that globalisation, the whole idea that Britain can specialise in banking, arms and pharmaceuticals and import everything else is an utterly failed model, an utterly way, failed way of thinking about things. What we need to do is bring food production back to Britain. And in terms of fruit, at the moment, 7% of the fruit we eat is grown in Britain. Now, it used to be that you know, Kent was famous for its apple orchards. Surrey was famous for its pear orchards. We've tried very, very hard most of the clothing you're wearing will have been made on the other side of the world. And yeah, the classic model is the cotton is grown in Azerbaijan, picked by a 10-year-old who should have been in school, but was forced out into the fields instead, shipped over to China to be spun into yarn, shipped down to Sri Lanka, or indeed, as we've just seen most tragically, to over to Bangladesh, and sewn into a T-shirt, and then shipped onto our nearest Thai street. And, you know, there you've bought the five-pound T-shirt. And five-pound really doesn't reflect the cost of that T-shirt. You know, as we've seen very tragically in Bangladesh, the cost of that T-shirt is really far, far higher. And what we've got to do is change our economy so that we're making our, our clothing back in Britain again and paying people decently, not sweatshop wages, safe conditions, all of the rest of it. The other side of all of that, the food production, the manufacturing, is we need to also bring jobs back to Britain. And what we need to do is restore strong local economies. There was actually a leading article in the FT a couple of months ago, which put it very well. Banks should be a utility. They should be like a gas or a water company. They provide the service, the flow of money, they store the money when you want them to store the money, and they just do that. It's like a basic, really boring service. We are, ba we are the same as everybody else, but uniquely, we have a scientific basis for our policy. Uniquely, we have a no-whipping system. So it means that we have grown used to the idea of agreement and consensus when we enter into politics. And ultimately, I think we have a respect for the people that we represent.